Ladies and gentlemen, if you could take your seats, we'll get this keynote speaker session under the way, underway. You might be aware, if you've been reading your notifications uh, from ACFID, ACFI, that International Civil Society Week, uh, which is, running, is run by Civicus, a global civil society NGO, is happening in the Pacific in December in Suva. It's going to be hosted by Civicus, Piango, our sister Peak Body, National Platform Organisation in the Pacific. And our next keynote speaker is actually going to be one of the many prominent Pacific Island civil society leaders that will be participating in International Civil Society Week. If you're interested to find out more, we have sent uh, our details, but you can certainly ask uh, ACFID Secretariat staff for the details for that, what will be a global gathering of civil society actors uh, in Suva in the first week of December. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Nolene Namulivu. Nolene is the political advisor to Diverse Voices in Action, or DIVA, for equality in Fiji. She's a grassroots educator, feminist researcher, activist, and social organiser in Fiji and the Pacific. She's worked for over 30 years to strongly affirm and protect universal human rights and advance Pacific-led transformative approaches on sexual rights, gender, social and economic, ecological and climate justice, building and sharing knowledge and experience and skills in local, national, regional, and global south spaces. DIVA concentrates its work in urban poor communities in rural and remote constituencies, working with lesbian, bisexual, transmasculine people, as well as wider women-led social organising or organisations in the Pacific small island states. She has a double degree in international relations and peace building from the University of New England and a diploma in community arts management. She lives and works from Suva in Fiji. Please give a warm round of applause for Nolene. Hello, how are you all today? Good, enjoying the, the last part of this wonderful thing. This is my first ACFID, so I really um, feel privileged to be here with you, honored to be here with you. I really thank the Wurundjeri people, the custodians of the place on which we meet here for your, for your warm welcome yesterday um, and for the opportunity to discuss um, things of great importance to us um, and to you and, and to all of us together. Um, just thank you to the ACFID, um, 2017 organizers. I feel like there's something bubbling here that I'm really glad to be a part of. Um, this is a crazy day for me, so you're gonna have to excuse me a little bit. I'm speaking four times today. I don't know how I let that happen, um, but, but one of the things about this is, you know, I have this really beautiful um, woman mentor, feminist mentor from the South who's passed away, and she always says, when things are the toughest, that's why we have our praxis, and that's why we work so hard um, over many, many years. So. Um, bear with me on this. Um, I'm going to try, I could speak about this forever, um, about how we work together better, um, about how we are more loving to each other, how we work our practices together, but I'm going to try and keep it to 20 minutes. Um, and then I was thinking, it's a little tough in this space sometimes to ask the questions that you really want to ask. So if you've got something you want to write down on a piece of paper on your table, I know they're there. You can just pass it anonymously if you'd rather ask a prickly question. Um, and you don't want to name yourself, um, but I, I hope that we're going to have enough time um, to do some of that joint work together, no matter how big um, the space. So one of the things that I thought I'd do is, um, as a South feminist who's nearly 50, um, and who, since I was a young woman, maybe about 15 or 16, where I started to kind of self-identify as a feminist and to work out for me what was my political project, and you know that, that's changed over time. Um, some things have stayed the same for, for me and my politics, but a lot of it has hopefully deepened and, and I've been challenged and I've critiqued myself um, a, a, along that long journey. Um, so I want to start with, um, with the personal as political and then talk a little bit more about some of the beautiful things that I think South feminism and also global um, feminist and women human rights defender led work 
have done and contributed to development praxis, to, uh, to humanitarian praxis, um, but really just to how we are as humans with each other in the world, with other species, and ecologically uh, what we're doing to this, this planet. So every day I get to go to work with um, nine uh, women and people um, in a collective that started in 2011. It's called Diverse Voices in Action for Equality, or DIVA for Equality, we love the name. Um, and we're reclaiming it um, for many, many reasons. And one of the things about that is that um, people talk a lot about invisibilization and marginalization of people, and we're determined not to just speak from um, survivor narratives or victim narratives, but to really stand in our power and to re-articulate for ourselves and with others about what it means to be an, a lesbian, bisexual, transgender, masculine, um, and gender non-conforming people's collective in Fiji, in the Pacific small island states, in the economic south, close to Australia and New Zealand, in this vast um, Pacific region. So, how do we do this work? Um, it comes, and this is why it's as important to look backward as it is to, to go forward and to look forward. Um, we, we base our praxis on beautiful sets of work that have been set up over decades um, by those like Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, but also many, many other um, feminist and, and, um, and progressive left um, social movements. We work um, to a set of praxis that has at least four areas in the model. And one area that we, what we tend to do is we can place anything that, that we really want to speak about, put it in the middle, and then we talk about section reproductive health and rights and bodily autonomy and integrity. So that's one part. And then we also look at it and we say, what about the political economies of globalization? And then thirdly, we look at political restructuring and social transformation. And then fourth, we often look at political ecology and sustainability. And then we say, okay, that's too high tech language. And we get caught in the trap of language and I'll talk a, a little bit about that later. So in our nine hubs that we work on um, and with and through in Fiji, but also in the social movements with which we work uh, regionally and then globally, we take any issue and we talk about bodies and our decision making. We link it to discussions of land and money and resources. We think about the collectivities and institutions within which we live and move every day. And fourth, we think about the air, the water, the connection to ocean, to waterways, and to other species and the planet as a whole. So we can take the same language, and the reason why I do that in both those ways is to say we often get to told that it's too hard to do feminist or um, heterodox thinking, and that it's too hard to place that into different contexts, and that people won't understand, and that it can't be part of the local way of living. But what we try to do is kind of think that through and say, mm, not so sure about that. Let's just see. Watch us. And so why do we do that? One of the ways we do, one of the reasons we do that is often I find that myself, but, but so many of the women with whom I work and the people with whom I work get spoken to as if we are add-ons to INGOs, if we're good for color and, and brightness sometimes. We might be talking heads on a panel are not so great for practical implementation, or you're a little bit too feminist, a little bit too prickly, or maybe you're not enough for others, maybe too Fiji-focused, or why do you have to use that self-feminist frame all the time? So we're continually even negotiating with others on what is legitimate and what is not in the way in which we move our lives and our work. So how did we kind of work through that in a transformative way? Well, uh, there were three of us out of the nine in the original collective that came from earlier work. And so we brought with us all of our beautiful bags. Um, and we did no external work for the first two and a half years of DIVA. Really, very minimal, just kind of urgent action work. But what we did was we healed and learned together as women and people. 
we broke down what we had kind of come with into the collective, and then we found emergent theories and skills that we wanted to put forward into place, and then we practiced it. And we practice social organizing skills and methods. And one of the funny things I always think about is in those early circles, you know, a lot of you have, who's been part of a feminist circle? A circle of any kind? Yeah, many. And in the, end, or in the first few that we did, we'd be sitting there and maybe two people would speak from the entire collective. Because it's very difficult when you've been harmed and traumatized and when you've been told that you have no place and no power to move, it's very difficult to find yourself in a space that opens itself to you. It takes time. It takes time to do that, and that means that some of the work has to be slow. It has to take its time, it's catalytic, and you never know when the moment is for someone when it's their time to speak. We also did things like we learned to draw, literally to visually map out some of these ideas that people said were too hard to talk about. Intersectionality, power negotiation, the golden apple. How do you explain different philosophical and social movement positions and ideas and how do we make it real for ourselves? And we had to learn to be confident in the way we speak and move that. We were also, through this praxis, having to peel back the layers of patriarchy because they sit in us and they sit on our bodies and I'm sure everyone here can relate to that. But you can only move with confidence externally as your own confidence grows as people and as collectives and then in the way that you can move with love with other people. So even though we move slowly, in the second year we we turned down over 200,000 US dollars because people thought we were ready and we didn't think we were. But we now have over nine hubs in urban, poor, rural and remote areas of Fiji and we work strongly both at, in Pacific SID spaces but also in Asia and Pacific um, and when we have to in the global spaces. It's not easy. One of the wonderful things that I like about um, some African um, feminist queer um, activists that I work with is that they talk about the fact that we talk as if we're working local to global, but really we are the global. And that is a very localized, small space in New York or in Geneva. And so we really reclaim that and we talk about the fact that we are the ones who hold the knowledge. And those are our spaces. And when they don't feel like our spaces because they're you know, you have to take multi-sector flights to get there. I have to go after this to, to Germany um, to, to be part of a climate change conference and a 50-year-old body doesn't want to do it. So you have to build both your capacity to do it but also to kind of delegate and share and work out how as South Feminists we're going to find our way into those spaces. How as those who care about what happens in those local spaces in New York that are very, very hard to move in and where they're very closed, and where there's particular roles and language that are used to exclude as much as they talk about the rhetoric of inclusion. And how do we influence those structures and processes and the content, not just be brought there to speak, but really have an influence on how things shift and move in this world. So, one of the, the ways that we're trying to keep building ourselves, and I'm really trying to think through about leadership as I speak right now, is about the fact that we take very seriously what we have moved as part of feminist movements. So one of those, and this also comes from wonderful work through um, the, the, the leftist um, social movement work in, in Latin America, for instance, is about this idea of praxis of action and reflection cycles. And it really is a radical thing though, because when you think about that against Gantt charts and um, you know all these plans that all of us have to be um, fluent in, in order to access certain kinds of funding, in order to access certain kinds of rooms, when I speak to a minister of finance, he doesn't want to hear about my praxis and action and reflection. He wants to know how that translates through to a very siloed policy model and how I'm going to speak in a way that he, can, he or she can hear. 
So how do we do that work of language? One of the things that we did when we started was we said, we will not recruit from outside. We will build from inside. All very well and good to say that, but when you're trying to build work really fast and when there's urgent action and you're trying to do it um, in, a, in a small island space where we've had four coups, where we have quite militarized existence, um, but we've done it so far. We decided that we didn't want anyone to be supplanted by newcomers, by educated, by elites, um, because if we need new skills, we can build it from within. It's harder and it takes longer, but it really builds a sense of trust and ownership of the collective that helps you to move faster when you move. But what that also requires then, in terms of system change, is that we have to have quite radical forms of transparency within the organization. And we also have to have co-learning and accompaniment of each other in the MC and in the wider hubs. And it means that those of us who are gifted with leadership are given it for a certain amount of time, but it's very clear that it's a gift. And that means that there is still an understanding that you will be checked and you will be critiqued and you will be open to that critique from those with whom you work. Very tough. Good thing to say it, but very hard to live it. So everyone sees the full accounts on a monthly basis in our management collective. Um, we do the programming design together. We do the MEL design and implementation. Everyone writes the concept notes and the budgets and everyone has a receipting system. We do the acquittals and reportings. We are teaching this over time to the hubs. Everyone writes the narrative reports. All of us have to orally present on our work together and we're all expected to build deep and useful research and analytical skills, facilitation skills, advocacy and movement building. And what's interesting is that the DNA of an organization, I think, shows up in times of stress and strain. And where there's power imbalances and you work from ego over love or there's a mismatch between the rhetoric and the reality or personal ambition all of a sudden is happening over collective concern, it shows up quickly whenever there's stress. But the response when that happens is really the key because we're all human. What happens when someone violates the trust of another? How do we respond from an ongoing set of praxis and not from judgment? We have this happen all the time. So we need to have a whole set of planes of possibilities and strategies from which we draw. It's getting better over time, and, and part of that is this explicit focus on being a learning organization. And the second thing I wanted to say is intersectionality is not just these willy-nilly identities that we throw around about who we are, whether we're this age or people with disabilities or a lesbian or a woman from rural and remote areas. We're very good at doing that language now, I think, as development actors and activists. But so many of us live with such pain in our daily lives and they're accumulated over time and place. And this is particularly so for us as LBTI women everywhere in the world, but including in Fiji. And so the experience of failure can be really hard particularly hard for us in our group. And so where you experience further critique and conflict from the sensitive work that you're doing, the world already gives you such rejection and you have to be careful that we don't have organizations that perpetrate that and that make it even harder. We have challenges with our intimate partners, with our wider relationships with our families. We have to negotiate all of that. Many of us who are part of the hubs and the work that we do are living in transient street prison accommodation or in informal safe houses. And now we have climate change and disasters to deal with even more and more and in ferocity. So we have to build and maintain our praxis. This is not some fuzzy hippy dippy concept. This is about what keeps us safe and sane as we move our work. When we live lives where there's such judgment and exclusion and damage to our self-esteem, it takes time to scrub the patriarchy off every day and we have to repeat it all the time. And I really want us to think about that, that this is not about check boxes of intersectionality. It's about the ways that people have to build the number of hours in a day when you feel that you have freedom and autonomy 
And, but while the world keeps nudging and pushing and shouting at us that you're not doing enough or you know, it's not deep enough or we're not moving in the way or you're not monitoring and evaluating enough. That's why the fifth work stream for us at Diva is ecosystems of activist care and a sustainable organization because it's the only way we're gonna do it is by being deliberate. Two minutes remaining. Whoa, okay, might take a little longer than that. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna move. One of the things that we do is, fourth, we refuse to be talked about as if we're only one part of our, our identities. So there's a lot of people who, because it's unusual, right? We, we have not that many um, lesbian, bisexual, transgender um, organizations that are out and open in the Pacific. So many of us get just, you know, invited to spaces where they want to talk to us about our sexuality. Yeah, right, but we want to talk to you about economics, and we want to talk to you about ecology, and we want to talk to you about all of the other things that are part of our lives every day. So we're very, very strong on that. Um, sometimes we still get, you know, why are a bunch of queer Pacific women doing work on economics or climate change, but less and less of it because we try and go in prepared and we go in um, with full identities. Um, and we say work with us as whole people and not just as part of who I am. And people adjust or not. If they don't, then goodbye and we work somewhere else. We find another way, guerrilla style to move. I really loved the morning panel yesterday, but I really loved the discussion on social movement strategy because I think that's very important. We have to be fierce and prickly in our politics. We have feminist principles that we draw on. We have a code of conduct. You have yours. And that's nuanced over time. And we use this to keep the fire on, to keep it burning while on the tough days especially, and that's our safety and our grace. Um, I think the next thing is yeah, having the honest conversations, and not just within the organization, but with each other. It's really hard. People don't want to be lectured, I don't either. I'm 50 years old, I'm kind of over that. Um, but at 50 years old, what I know is that we have to have some discussions that, have, that are disruptive and uncomfortable. So we have to do that, but we have to do it with love. Uh, I don't want to waste your time, you don't want to waste mine. So, yes, two. <gasps> we got a little bit more time. You can still go with me for 15 minutes? All right. Including Q&A. Including Q&A. So, okay. So I'll keep it to 10 and then we'll have more time to talk. Okay. So. So one of the things that I'm thinking about a lot is, you know, there's some things that we, we speak about in the economic South, yeah, very different, you can't just say all economic South the same, but equally, you might not want to hear it here in Australia, my mom's Australian, so I always feel this lovely liminal thing where I can speak as well from that side, so I can be prickly. Um, but equally, what I really don't want is I don't want to see my islands underwater and I don't want to see so much of Pacific SIDS politics dominated by those in the, the region like Australia or New Zealand or those with power in, and it's not just Australia and New Zealand, it's EU, it's, it's the US, it's China. There's so much what I call hyperdevelopmentalism in our region and we don't talk about it a lot except when it gets to crisis point or I'll tell you, we talk about it in our little corners and that's not the way we need to be discussing it. We need to be doing it in the rooms like this. I really don't like development that's brought to me by someone else who thinks that they know better than those beautiful, wonderful people with whom I live and work. Um, and you know, sometimes my capacity is not the problem. Sometimes the problem is the state of a state. Sometimes it's my state, but sometimes it's your state. Sometimes it's the extraterritorial actions of your state and its impact on my country on the geopolitical decision-making that gets done in those local spaces, whether it's here or Bangkok or New York or Geneva. And I can give you like three examples which you already know about because you made some resolutions yesterday. How is it possible to have a postal vote about the most basic universal human rights for LGBTI people? How is that possible? But you're dealing with it with grace, with, and I really hope that there's a good response anyway, but how is that possible? How is it possible that we have 600 people waiting to find out where they're going to be? And I heard the emotion yesterday on the panel, and I feel it too, about Manas, and about Nauru, and about the so-called Pacific Solutions, because we know they don't work. And we know, can I say, that it's racist and yet here it still happens, and I don't understand. And I really would like to see some leadership. If we're talking about transformative leadership, 
then one, we already know exactly what needs to happen today to get them off that island. But two, it's about the safety of Manas and Nauru as well. And we're not talking about that enough. It's also about climate change, and I'll talk about that in a little minute. That deserves its own two minutes. But truthfully, we live in a time now where eight men, all of them white, own the same amount of resources as 50% of the population of our planet. And we live in a time where by 2030, we will have more plastic than fish in our ocean. And I want to talk about how, who we listen to and how we speak and how we value each other is about this issue of elitism and hierarchy and breaking it down. Because the language that we use can be the conveyor belt of elitism and hierarchy. It pushes certain kinds of formal educated people, and I include myself in this, onto places or stages where others could do perfectly well. It pushes minorities away if they don't fit certain established expert narratives. Can I tell you, when I first started talking about sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, I had no idea what they were talking about. But I was living it myself. And I was working with myself and others on homophobia and transphobia. But there were many spaces where I went into and where I felt really disempowered because I didn't have the language that someone else had. And we have to think about that. I work with some of the smartest, shrewdest women and people in the world, most of them with little formal schooling, most who have held on to life through violence and stigma that's truly disgusting in its form and its origin. And really what our task is to do is to help each other to hold, to build individual and collective knowledge and skills and confidence and a steel spine together over time to hold through the ridiculousness of racism and classism and ageism and ableism and homophobia and transphobia and intersex people's rights violations over their bodies and their lives and much more. And if some of you have a problem with the words we use as feminists, well, I had a problem understanding the phrase neoliberal capitalism, but no more. <laughs> because sure as hell, I learned it and I tried to work out what it means because what I know is that somebody else out there is making a lot of decisions over my life. So amongst all the other self-styled labels, I think we all should become heterodox economic activists, no matter what work we're doing. <laughs> Don't care about the paper qualifications because we need to know about trade and aid and fiscal policy and micro and macroeconomic relationships and how they move policy because I want to know how I can contribute to a movement fight that's about changing the way we produce, consume, and redistribute. I want co economies that heal and nurture rather than extract and oppress. So I'm going to cut short now. I'm going to end. I live in a region where every day another village is moved, another town's flooded, another beach slips underwater, another maternity unit has king tides sweep its equipment out to sea, another coral reef dies, another tuna species almost gone, while OECD distance water fisheries take the fish from our ocean and make it even hard for us to have food sovereignty. Did you know that nearly 90% of global fish stocks are either fully fished or overfished? It has a direct implication. It's part of our ecological justice struggle. And meanwhile, the OECD focus forecasts a 17% rise in fish production by 2025, in large part to meet the unsustainable overconsumption of fish in developed countries, including here in Australia. So a challenge or a request to you is, what are you going to do about that as ACFID as well? How do you see that as part of your role to disrupt and transform your own government's internal and external policy? How are we going to do that together as North and South? I really don't want to hear the line anymore, which I've heard from many of my North kind of colleagues, that we have different roles in this struggle. It'll cost us political capital. We have, you know, a reality check. I have to work with a government that's difficult, militarized, masculinist, patriarchal. Some days I have to be on the streets protesting, and other days I have to work with them in a room on policy on climate change. It's not easy. And I think that's all our struggle. Some of us stay completely out, perfect, and some of us have to do the moving between really difficult spaces. 
So the reality right now is that Australia is the largest and wealthiest member of the Pacific Islands Forum, and that on climate change policy right now, your government is completely at odds with the other 15 independent states of the Pacific Islands Forum. Increasingly, because Australia is the world's largest coal exporter, and offering subsidies for construction on what would be the world's largest export coal mine, the Adani Carmichael coal mine, and also promoting the construction of new generation coal-fired power plants abroad. How is that possible? Not, and not, you cannot just say you're going to do gender and climate change work because you do that well, because you do gender and human rights well. You can't, because it's about system change. It's a structural shift that we require on the climate response by your government and others in the economic north. And it may be difficult for you to hear, but I think we should have that discussion. Because if it's not delivered by one party at the next elections, if the other parties are smart, come up with a good policy on this, because the age of coal is over. And it's particularly over because we are in your region and we require your assistance and your help. So I'm just gonna close by showing you just some photos of some amazing women that are doing this work. One of the hardest things to do is when those who you care about, your family and others, they don't want you to speak in the way that you require speaking. And so this work on women defending the commons, I really hope some of you can join and be with us in our ongoing struggle. It's a global movement that we're trying to get going that is about social, economic, and ecological justice for all. I'm working with some of the most conservative groups. This is the oldest, most conservative indigenous group in the country, and we're probably considered the most radical feminist. But we're working together in new ways because we have to, because the planet is changing so much. We don't have decades. We keep hearing these ridiculous things about 2100. We've got two to three years before we're seeing massive ecosystem breakdown. Next year, look out for the IPCC report on 1.5 because it will tell us the huge gap between where we need to be and where we are right now. And this final one is just showing a group of women in one of the most remote um, islands in Fiji who are doing their own work on this. And if they can, then we can do it all better together. The basis of all of this is a deep and profound love for each other, but also for the planet. This is not the one of plastic flowers and furry fake animals that you give to each other, but of ahimsa, of the beloved community that we talked about yesterday, and of a search for shared justice. Because we need to be sharp and white hot, and sometimes that's about fury, as much as it's sometimes about calm and reason, strategy and creativity. And it's as fierce and beautiful as all of the women and people who are moving this work. So thank you for sharing me, sharing with me. And just one last thing that we say in Women Defending the Commons, we will never give up on this beautiful planet. Thank you. No time for questions. We, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you for that stellar, all-encompassing uh, presentation, Nolene, and also the, the power, because I think behind the many issues that you feel so passionately about is a, clearly an orientation, a disposition, and a systemic analysis and seeing the interconnectedness of things. So let's hear from our audience. Let's see what, how they respond and what questions they might have. Helen. Um, thank you so much. Just when I thought this conference couldn't deliver any more that um, excites and enlivens, you've lifted it a whole other level. My name's Helen Zoki. I'm the Chief Executive of Oxfam, so I'm part of that lumbering INGO community that try to operate in certain ways. Uh, we're not a movement. Uh, we're clear about that. We're a campaigning organisation we like to influence. Um, but I'd like you to unpack a bit um, to help us, because there are many of us in the room. Um, we can't be you, um, but we must have a role to play that's constructive. 
Um, we are in the Pacific. We have Pacific people working in our lumbering INGO organisation. Uh, we're trying to be south, but also be who we are. So it would be great, because you would have had many experiences of rubbing up against organisations like ours. And, um, and to, it, it, I would value greatly if you could just share and use it as a coaching session for the INGOs about how to behave. Thank you. Well, that's a hard one, but um, what I will contribute to the discussion is just to say, um, you're already doing some of the work on yourselves as Oxfam, I know, and I know there are others who are trying to do the same as INGOs, and, and, and it's recognized when that is genuinely moving. Um, so, for instance, the ability to look at geographic representation and to think through whether there was a need for an Oxfam Pacific, for instance, is a very um, strategic and also helpful move. How then you rearticulate, you know, within your own, as you say, lumbering INGO, sometimes not lumbering, sometimes galloping, um, is, also, um, is, is also difficult, but I think required. Um, one of the, the things that I found particularly useful when we do work with INGOs is one, knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, sometimes I think, Mm, and having that permeate through your, your organization, because sometimes I find that there are those who are operating from a kind of social movement perspective anyway. Um, I, I work with a really broad set of actors, and I can even work in kind of social movement-oriented ways with people within quite, quite kind of bureaucratic structures. I feel like there are ways that we can do that, but that requires a few things, and one of the things it requires is a, a, a knowledge of each other's politics, that's one. Two is a knowledge that just because we move in different ways doesn't mean that ours are less legitimate. Uh, and so that's a second kind of recognition. The third is, for instance, right now we're part of a, a coalition, uh, a, a kind of set of acti actors who are working together on the COP23 process, so it's called PCAN. And that's everyone from kind of small local NGOs through to Oxfam and, and Greenpeace and many others. You have to have those really kind of disruptive conversations, but you have to find ways to do that confidentially. This is the other thing, you know, the set of human relationships that you're required to, and not everyone gets it right. I think one of the things that happens a lot in these organizations, and I try and, you know what I try and do is distinguish between the posturing and the white noise and what really matters in the political disruptions. Because I feel like a lot of the time we waste our energy and time on the fact that it's just that maybe someone's politics they haven't thought through a little bit, you know? Maybe it's a, some kind of personality conflicts, you know? There are all these things that go on. But, but um, I think I'm probably better at doing it now than I probably would have been. I myself would probably have gone front and center, you know? Um, there are many of us who are born in the fire, and I think we, it's good to have that, but you also have to kind of work out when are the times when you enter the struggle with someone else, and when you just kind of say, enough for now. And that's about the social movement knowledge. It's about whether this is tactical strategy, whether this is a long-term relationship I'm building, whether I feel like there is a relationality between our organization and that organization. Another wonderful coalition that we're part of is this We Rise Coalition. We were very clear, one, one way to do this is don't make it about the funding. So we had an MOU between, and I can see Joe sitting around here somewhere. We were very strategic where we said we will draw our memorandum of understanding outside the DFAT funding model. Because we want to keep going regardless of whether we are working together you know, through a certain project-based funding, we want to work together as four feminist organizations. So being very, very clear on the politics within helps you to move um, outside. So I don't know how helpful that's been, but a little bit rambling, but <laughs> thank you. Hello, my name's Sarah Meredith, I'm from Global Citizen. Um, we're currently partnering with Northern Pictures, who's running, a, who's just uh, launched in Australia a documentary called The Blue, which looks at um, the state of our oceans, and particularly plastic. And we've asked our Global Citizens to become ocean guardians, and thousands of Australians have taken action. 
what I'm keen to hear from you is um, how can individual Australians take action? What would be the top two practical solutions in the next 12 months that we could encourage within the Pacific to take action and alert our government? Well, protect above everything else. Protect your Great Barrier Reef. The state of the ocean is to a point where we are really worried that as an ecosphere, and you would know this, that IPCC scientists are telling us that it's not just about the fact that the coral reefs are dying, it's the fact that that then has a chain of effects that is about the biodiversity in the ocean, which then is about food security, which then is about this unbelievable extinction pattern that we have. We have the sixth major um, uh, uh, extinction happening in the world right now. So one of them I would say is protect your oceans above all else. Protect your Great Barrier Reef. Because it's not yours, right? It's ours. As a planetary system, it's ours. And don't fall for the white noise. The second thing is, I absolutely think that unless we are clear that if we don't stop the coal mines right now, that the, inter, the, the, the effect on the entire global system is going to take us way beyond what we require. This is not about compliance with the Paris Agreement. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm tired, so I'm being a little bit you know, fuzzy here. But what I want you to understand is, please, this is not about a national struggle, Adani. This is a global struggle. That's why you see the Pacific Climate Warriors here with you. And you need to think about that as, as development and humanitarian workers. You know, all the people that you're struggling with around the world, this, these coal mines, we have to stop them. And this is one of the biggest coal mines in the world. And I know there are probably politicians who are sitting in this room who really don't want to hear this. You know, I've, I've been attacked on Twitter the last few months by both, both political parties here, by functionaries from both parties. And what I don't understand is, it's so clear, the science is so clear. So you, from your work in humanitarian work outside Australia, please work it out on how we're going to shut down the Adani coal mine. Because it's just too important, and that is about oceans. This is an inter, yeah? It's about the air and the water and the oceans and protecting everything as an ecosphere. So I really encourage you, I'm going to, to COP, and we have Fiji as the presidency, and we're pushing them full on. But we also know that as much as we can talk about specifics on mitigation and adaptation and finance, you know, all our governments want to talk about finance, they want to talk about means of implementation, but what it's really about is, we are going to have dangerous ecosystem breakdown. And we don't have until 2030 and the SDGs completion. We have now. And we are already starting to see in the meltdown of the Antarctic ice, we are seeing it in, we have not one healthy set of fisheries left in the world. That's unbelievable. So that's how urgent it is. For, for, for me, I'm putting down all my other work to do this ecological work because I don't understand how we can say that we care about humans and this planet if we are not working on climate and ecological justice. Every single one of us in this, in this room have to become part of that social movement. Thanks. Legal, and uh, you can see she is a very inspiring activist, but I think we take that warning, particularly with the COP coming up, COP23, and the warnings uh, from reports being released in the last few days of heading to a three degrees planet by the end of the century uh, very seriously. Thank you. One more round of applause for Nolene. Thank you. Thank you.